Hello everyone, I'm Diana Moraro, and on behalf of The Hill, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's briefing, Digitalizing Infrastructure, Building a Smart Future. A big thank you to our sponsor, ABB, for making this event possible. Technology is transforming the world around us, and infrastructure, the backbone of our economy, is no exception. As efforts to overhaul the nation's uh, aging infrastructure gather steam, our conversation this morning will examine our needs, challenges, and solutions. We'll explore the role digital technology is playing when it comes to modernizing the nation's cities, networks, structures, and pipelines. What should leaders and government consider when it comes to investing in new technologies? And what changes will need to be made to upgrade existing infrastructure? Can the public and private sectors collaborate to build smarter and resilient infrastructure? And are there regulatory changes we will need to address? On the program today, we will hear from key lawmakers, infrastructure experts, and industry leaders about leveraging innovation to build a smarter future. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. In addition to our audience here in the studio, we're live streaming on thehill.com. Please keep your phones on silent. We do encourage you to engage in the discussion on social media. You can follow us on Twitter at The Hill Events and comment using the hashtag SmartInfraFuture. We are going to be taking questions from the audience during the program, so please be on the lookout for members of our team with handheld mics. Finally, there is a short survey on your chairs. We'd love to hear your feedback about our events, so please complete the survey at the end of today's program. Let's dive right in. Our first speaker this morning is Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. Infrastructure investment and modernization are among her top priorities. She's also the author of the Capito Connect Plan, an effort to improve high-speed broadband access across her state. Welcome, Senator Capito. Joining our on stage will be The Hill's Editor-in-Chief, Bob Cusack. Bob, the floor is yours. Joining us today, I want to talk just a couple things uh, that have to get done between now and the end of the year. At least Republicans say that. Uh, first up, <laughs> tax reform. Um, are you optimistic that, that that's going to pass by the end of this year? I am. I'm very optimistic about tax reform. Uh, I think for a couple of reasons. Okay. Um, one, it, for me, it's good policy. It's been um, well vetted through 70 meetings on of the Finance Committee, and uh, we've been talking about it for a long time. I've been in the Congress, as you know, for uh -huh. more than a few years, and I think it presents us a, an opportunity that we haven't had. So I would say on the policy side, uh, we feel very confident that uh, we've kind of hit the sweet spot. On the political side, uh, I think it's, uh, it's probably a big driver of us getting this done, um, uh, us being Republicans to prove that we can do what we said we were going to do right. and that we can move forward on, on uh, a major change uh, with the president's uh, uh, leadership here. So I think policy and politically, we need to get it done. I think we're aiming, and we were talking in the back, I think we're aiming for the week after Thanksgiving. The House is going to pass their bill this week, we think. Our Finance Committee is working the bill right now. It has to go to budget and to energy, I believe, and then it will come onto the floor probably the week after Thanksgiving. And, and do you think that last week's election where uh, Democrats did very well, does that, that help the cause in a way? Like, because it's really, it's, you, you need to get something big done. Well, we need to get something big done. I, I, absolutely. I was in a Veterans Day parade on Saturday. Most of us, you know, when we went home, those are the kinds of things that you do, especially uh, on, on Veterans Day. And I, I wasn't sure really what to expect because there's been, you know, ups and downs, I think, over the last, this past year in terms of people being energized about us or not so much. And I got a lot of get it done. We want tax reform. We, I mean, I was really surprised. Uh -huh. And so I think, uh, I, don't, I think regardless of what happened in the elections, I, I think it's more a function of um, our failure to pass on health care right. and our, um, uh, our really internal need and want to be together to pass something that we think is good for the country. Um, and before we get to, to infrastructure and broadband, mm -hmm. also 
we have spending deadlines coming up next right. next month. Uh, where do you see, you sit on the Appropriations Committee. Do. Where do you see that going? Do you think that it's going to have to be a bipartisan deal? Right. One way or the other. Uh, my understanding is that leaderships are working uh, to do the top line numbers bipartisan. Mm -hmm. uh, we obviously have an incomplete process that's broken, very broken appropriations. Uh, there are four subcommittee markups, mine of which is one, have not marked up yet. On the Senate side, the House did pass all their bills, so congratulations to them. And uh, so I think what we'll see, I mean, I, I'd rather see an omnibus where we can actually make some changes, but I, I have an inkling that after we do tax reform and moving, we may move to a CR that's maybe an extended month or two. I, that's total speculation on my part. I don't have inside information. We like on that speculation, one. though. That's good. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, tell us, you, you have been a, a leader on broadband, and I think a lot of people in urban areas, specifically DC, they don't realize that, that access to the internet is not everywhere. Uh, and, and you have a Capito Connect plan. T tell us a little bit about that and the, the struggles in your state on, on, on technology and what needs to be done. Right. Well, this has been one of my passions since I um, came to the Senate. I realized when I was campaigning in, in the entire state that uh, the lack of connectivity was just stark. Uh -huh. And we started out uh, with, Cap we called it Capito Connect, which is to help our constituents connect with federal resources to find out how to do it. We've been trying to talk to all the innovators in, that, in this space whether it's satellite, wireless, you know, I am agnostic on technology. I just want to, I just want it delivered. Uh, and so I've had big and broad discussions on this. Um, we've worked with uh, the, the um, chairman of the FCC, uh, Chairman Pai, came, has been to West Virginia now twice. Uh, our, our connectivity is 56% of our state of West Virginia is not connected to high speed internet. 56. 56. Wow. And, and how has that changed maybe from a while back, or has it gotten a lot better, or is it? Well, the problem stagnant? is the FCC changes the metrics of what they consider to be connectivity. So you know, it used to be 10, now it's 25. So you know, we're, we're obviously, we're making progress, but every time we make a, a little bit jump forward, we're still lagging behind the new and, and better connectivity. We, have, we don't have a great adoption rate, which is an issue for us. So what we did with Commissioner Pai and uh, Commissioner Clyburn came as well, uh, we, we talked about tourism, telehealth, economic development, um, schooling, um, education. It just uh -huh. hits every aspect of our life. And, and, and we're struggling uh, economically as a state. We're an energy state who's had a very difficult time um, with our coal industry. We've got to transition. We can't make that transition without this connectivity. Um, one of our native sons, John Chambers, uh, has been helping, uh, helping us as well. Uh, and uh, so you know, we're, we're trying to do whatever we can and, uh, and try to find the federal resources. One of the things we need to have is accurate mapping. That's an issue with the FCC. We've talked to Commissioner Pai about that. If you say you're covered, it's only it's covered in a space. Well, one person could be covered in the block, but the rest of the people couldn't. Um, we've had some big issues with that. So they're trying to straighten that out. Uh -huh. So It's kind of an all hands on deck sort of thing, but there's many articles that are written that if you don't have this connectivity, you will, the digital divide will, will really hurt you uh, economically, and we can see it in our state. Where do you see, you know, the transportation was supposed to be addressed earlier, and uh, right. healthcare pushed it back, and now tax reform, and it's kind of like a, a chore uh, where people keep saying, well, get to that next month. And, and do you think it actually could pass in, a, in an election year? Well, I'm ever the optimist, I will say that. Uh, I think it can because I think it, I, I think infrastructure, particularly in a package that uh, has been discussed, is, is a definite bipartisan uh, issue. Uh -huh. uh, I'll take my state for example. Uh, unbelievably, and I'm very proud of our state for this, we just passed a huge bond in our state to up our infrastructure. It, it, it includes raising the gas tax in a state like West Virginia, which is politically extremely difficult. It also, um, uh, it's like a $1.5 billion project. Huh. Uh, and I think in a state like ours, it was well presented as how this is going to benefit you every day in your life, whether it's a road, a bridge, um, connectivity, or whatever. And, and so I think we can do that on the, on the federal level. It's always the, the problem's going to be the pay for, and right. how do you pay for it? Uh -huh. 
Um, my understanding is that the administration, and we've had several hearings on this, is, is very high on public-private partnerships. I say in a state like West Virginia, a, a rural state, uh -huh. Where do you get the private investment? What, what private invest in, investor is going to come in and help us when the, really the, the payback for them is uh, sight unseen, unless right. you're going to toll every road or something like that, which is a non-starter. So I think the pay-for issue is probably where we'll stumble. Uh, the concept bipartisan, we're going to stumble on how to pay for it. But I think we can, I think we can um, mount that challenge, and I, I think we can do that. What do you think should be... In that legislation, what are what are the the remedies to the? Everyone agrees that the transport the nation's transportation system is crumbling. Mm -hmm. um, should there be a gas tax? Well, you know, what what are you, the ingredients that you should think definitely should be in that kind of bill? Well, I do like the aspect of um, of the of the public private partnership, but I'd like to see it in an expanded kind of concept there. So, for instance, again, back to my state where we just passed a very big investment. In, uh, in infrastructure in, in our entire state. Let us get some credit for that on the statewide so we could put, put that as a match towards a federal dollar. Uh, so let the states innovate. Uh, we saw, and I'm, I, I know that we've got Virginians in the room, but several years ago, Virginia kind of reshaped the way they're going to pay as a state on their transportation. Indiana obviously did that uh, uh, under... Um, uh, Governor uh, Mitch Daniels uh, reshaped their transportation. So l challenge the states to innovate there to, to be able to, you know, match the federal dollars that are, that are going to be coming in. I don't believe a gas tax will be in there. It's certainly the simplest way to uh, afford a transportation issue, but uh, I don't see us doing that. There was a lot of discussion on repatriation of dollars going to infrastructure. I'm on those bills. But uh, the repatriation dollar is getting, uh, is getting scooped up into tax reform, so I don't believe that's going to be available as a source of funding. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think we've got to be, be ready to uh, everybody have some skin in the game. It's not going to be the federal government coming in and just throwing money out into projects like, honestly, it was in 2010, uh -huh. where we saw a lot of waste and we didn't get the real bang for the buck. Um, you mentioned telehealth. How important is that uh, in a state like uh, West Virginia, uh, where you know people again in ur urban areas don't realize that hospitals can be a long way I, off uh, from their house? Well, in a in a state like ours, which is actually a small state, but it may look like to drive thirty miles. Oh, well, that around here. Well, around here, that would take four and a half hours, but uh, in a normal situation, uh, it would take 30 minutes, you know, if you're driving 60 miles an hour. You can drive 30 miles in West Virginia, and it can take you an hour because of the, you know, the terrain and all that. So, you know, rural areas have the challenge. What you have to realize is we do have community health centers and rural hospitals that may be accessible, but they don't have a specialty care that, say, we have in Morgantown or Charleston or Huntington. And so that's where I think telehealth, a couple things, can really be beneficial. We can have the, um, the specialty telehealth availability through your community health center. We did a thing uh, with a community health center in Clay County, an hour away from Charleston, where it was a, it was a scan, a retinal scan of your eye. Uh -huh. You have the ophthalmologist sitting an hour away uh, talking to the, uh, with the community health uh, nurse and 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 I was they were actually scanning my eye at the time and and could you know see a lot there so you have an elderly person doesn't really have transportation they can get to their little town because they can they're close enough for that but they can't it's very difficult to get an hour in the other way I see telehealth um, developing and I'm very excited about this aspect of it is really the monitoring of of your health, your own personal health. If you're an elderly person, particularly, if you can every day kind of tune in or maybe fingerprint in, or I won't even get into the technology because I'm not great on that, but some way to say, this is what my blood pressure is today, or this is what my blood sugar is today. And then you can get back from, you know, you wouldn't have to have a specialist doctor. You could just have a, you know, a, a nursing assistant or somebody who could actually say, okay, what you need to do is you know, up your medicine here, or you're right on track here. So you could have actual virtual moni uh, health monitoring in your own home. Got to have the connectivity for that. Right. And that's why I would keep going back to that. So I think the availability of specialty care, availability of, of home health care, keep people in their homes uh, longer. Uh, those two aspects of telehealth, I think, are um, 
really hold great promise for rural areas. Uh, you uh, helped found the, the Broadband Caucus. Right. Uh, who is in it? How often do you meet? And do you see that other senators have these same challenges in their states? Every state has this challenge. I'm actually on a bill with uh, Senator Gillibrand, where you would think New York. Wow, how could that possibly have connectivity problems? Well, New York's not all New York City. Right. And uh, they have a, a lot of rural areas there. And what we're trying to engage there is uh, the old rural utility service through the Department of Agriculture to really open up their availability of funding, which they have, but to make, uh, make more funding available through that, through ag to the rural areas. So we have, um, on the Rural Broadband Caucus, we have Angus King from Maine. Mm -hmm. We have Heidi Heidkamp from uh, North Dakota, John Bozeman from Arkansas. Um, oh, I'm going to forget somebody. Um, oh, Klobuchar uh -huh. uh, is one of our co-chairs. And uh, what we've done is we've tried to focus different areas. The first meet, we meet about once a month. We have uh, uh, hearings on the Hill. We tried to focus beginning on the uh, affordability, like how do you deploy this? How expensive? One of our providers told me one time, well, Shelly, it just takes time and money. Well, <laughs> that's great, but we don't have the time to wait, and let's figure out how to get the money. So we had public and private uh, folks available for that. Then we went to telehealth. We had some real innovative from a lot of different states, uh, you know, California, Alaska, uh, came in to try to show what they're doing in telehealth, Mississippi, West Virginia. Um, we had our, our retinal scan folks there uh, to show what's being done and how people are innovating on telehealth. Uh, we're going to go to education. I mean, if, if your child is uh, given an assignment and they go home and they, they, they can't connect, they come back to school and they're behind. Uh -huh. And that's not fair either. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, innovations. Uh, Angus King was telling me about and a, a, a program in Maine where uh, at the library you can check a hotspot out and take it home and, uh, and then bring it back you know, the next day where you would get uh, some connectivity. So we've, we've found a lot of common ground, and this is not, I mean, I just named a few of the members. We have a pretty broad, it's a very bipartisan, very broad uh, splash throughout the country. We'll open up for questions in, in a few minutes, so think of your questions. Uh, in about uh, three or four minutes. Uh, how important is worker, both worker training and also worker retraining as, as the, you know, the aging population? Uh, that's an issue for Medicare, but also for the workforce. Mm -hmm. Well, we, I think, are ground central on worker retraining. Um, as I mentioned, we've lost over 10,000 uh, coal mining jobs over the last several years, um, painfully so. But, uh, and, and a lot of these were jobs that are $70,000, $80,000 jobs, younger workers uh, in and around the coal industry, not just miners themselves, but other industries uh, surrounded by this. So that's been a challenge for us. And we've actually targeted some funds through the Department of Labor and other uh, available federal funds to retrain. Uh, and, and we've had some success with that. So retraining, what would you retrain into? Well, we have an aerospace uh, industry developing in North Central. We have uh, we have our natural gas industries, which is another industry uh, which has similar kinds of um, um, work-related skills. Uh, but what I, I think the best thing that we can do is really look at our career and technical schools uh, and make sure that they are agile enough to meet the challenges of where that where those needs are. Uh -huh. uh, we've, we've got quite a bit of uh, coding going on in the elementary and, 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 or in the elementary and junior high and, and high schools. We need to get more of that. We need to get uh, more of the STEM fields into West Virginia. <coughs> West Virginia University and Marshall University uh, have played big roles here, as I think they have in all states. If you look at Pittsburgh, the downturn of the steel industry, which was very painful for them. Uh -huh. What did they do? They recreated themselves, and a lot of it was through the University of Pittsburgh, Carnegie Mellon, Duquesne, through their universities pulling together to really sort of lead the way. And that's the kind of energy that we're looking for in our state to do retraining, but also we have a brain bleed in our state where our young folks are leaving uh, our beautiful state uh, to go elsewhere, and we need to create the kind of employment opportunities where they can stay and live and work with a place they love. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't we open up for questions? If you can uh, raise your hand and just identify yourself, and we have and wait for the mic uh, right up here. 
Senator, good morning. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Morgan, and uh, I'd like to shift my question to opioids okay. and the opioid epidemic. Yes. Uh, your state in West Virginia has had some challenges right. with being able to get out in front of this opioid epidemic that the nation faces. And my question to you and for folks like you and members on the Hill, uh, do you think or, or what is your sensing of uh, the Senate and Congress looking at technology and systems that have the capability of doing real-time opioid monitoring and tracking connected to decentralized state PDMP or prescription drug monitoring programs to try to get out in front of this epidemic before either nefarious users or people that are addicted um, get their hands on prescriptions that they shouldn't. Right. What's, what's your sensing on that? Thank you for that question. That is a huge issue in our state. Uh, we have, unfortunately, the highest uh, percentage of um, deaths from drug overdoses. We are sort of uh, Appalachia in general. You see it in Ohio, uh, Eastern Kentucky, West Virginia, Southwest Virginia. Really hit us hard. And then, uh, remarkably, New Hampshire, which is just sort of a, uh -huh. uh, a different kind of a look. But uh, what, what's happened, I think, is we, w with the prescriptions of all the... Um, pain medicines, there was not enough monitoring, there was not enough cross-state monitoring, and, and it got way out of control And before anybody really realized what was going on. So I think using technology to track from the pharmacy, from the doctor, but you know these folks are smart. Uh, you, you find out, well, we're tracking at the pharmacy, we're tracking with the doctor, but if you pay for cash, we're not really tracking. You know, if you pay your insurance, the insurance companies are trying to help, you know, with the tracking. So there's ways that we've really tried to tighten that up in terms of prescriptions. But I think what we need to be looking to is a diversion for, of uh, uh, addictive pain medicines into uh, alternative pain therapies, but that's a whole different topic. So what has happened with us, once the, once the squeeze on on these prescriptions began to, and the monitoring systems began to develop much better, um, the addicted person turned to heroin, turned to the streets, to a cheap drug, uh, and now they're lacing this with fentanyl, and we have just a huge heroin problem, which for somebody like me who was, you know, raised in the, I mean, I was born in the 50s, you know, I thought heroin was a thing of the past or reserved for, you know, rock stars or something. And now these are friends of mine's children that we've lost. And, and so we've got to be more aggressive with where we are. I think we, you know, we passed the Carabell Comprehensive uh, Addiction and Recovery Act. We passed 21st Century Cures to try to get at this. But I think we need technology to help us. We need our medical schools to help us. We, need, we just need everything, a spectrum of solutions. And technology can be helpful, but at the same time, it is such an intense, um, an intense addiction, strong uh, pull for people. You still have to have the on-the-ground uh, mental health counselors, nurses, uh, you know, all kinds of different treatment options. Uh, it, it, I, I'm really afraid we're going to lose a generation. And for my friends in states who don't really have this problem, I tell them, you don't have it today. If we don't knock it here, you're going to have it. Tomorrow. It's coming. It, it's just a matter of time. And it's, it's very, very sad. In the back there. For 30 years. Um, the MTA has a $30 billion capital program. So the capital program keeps infrastructure modern, innovative, et cetera. In the federal government, they're going to spend, I think, about $100 billion a year, this year, next year, on IT. And the IT Modernization Act is $500 million. It seems like that is a prescription for technology to keep falling behind. And I wonder your comment on um, shouldn't we consider IT to be infrastructure? Well, I think that's a, a, an interesting, as, a, as an appropriator, I see coming through my subcommittee IT modernization funds for just about everybody. But what bothers me about it, even, even last year when I was the chair of the legislative branch where the Secretary of the Senate is budget is in there, they want a modernization uh, aspect of, uh, of, of IT, and they want to spread it over five years. 
well, you guys are IT specialists. You spread it over five years. By the time you get to five years, it's, it's done. You finish your project and, and, and you're antiquated already, or you're out of what, what could be better for you. That's why I think, I think the president has put some emphasis on this in terms of trying to centralize this IT modernization rather than everybody siloing their own modernization on their own. I don't know how successful he's going to be with that. I, I'm fine with moving that into an infrastructure package. I mean, you don't want to bloat it up with a bunch of things, but it's tied to transportation. It's try, tied to uh, deployment of uh, connectivity. Uh, so I, I mean, it has a, um, uh, certainly has a uh, peripheral, maybe not peripheral, but a central theme. The other thing is, if we don't modernize our IT, I can't tell you how many hearings I've sat through where it's cybersecurity all day long. And if you're not modernizing, you're just much more vulnerable to uh, attacks, and nefarious attacks, and uh, weaknesses that uh, can influence like the MTA or, or uh, our transportation system or even you know, our banking system or whatever. So I think that's an area of, um, of great need, expense, but we gotta collapse these timelines because if we wait five years, we're never gonna get there. I mean, the IRS is their, their infrastructure. Nobody feels sorry for the IRS, but I mean, the IRS's infrastructure <laughs> is very antiquated. And if they were to, they can't even find some people to write some of their code sometimes because it's so old. Oh, well, one more question. We and that's fine quickly. as long as it's my tax return, but. <laughs> Good morning, Senator. Uh, John Bird with MAPS, the Association of Mapping and Geospatial Firms, as well oh. as the National Society of Professional Surveyors. So appreciate your Good. comments earlier about accurate mapping data. Right. Um, another portion of infrastructure that's due in early December is the flood insurance program in NFIP. And uh, behind the scenes, USGS and FEMA are working very closely with the 3D elevation program, which focuses on accurate elevation data right. nationwide. And the opportunity is to leverage what's going on with FEMA and NFIP with potential transportation and any other kind of right. infrastructure projects. You talk about digital mapping, surveying geospatial data, and how what kind of importance you see for basic infrastructure moving forward. Well, for my state, it has a lot of hills and valleys. Uh, the elevation uh, mapping is really important. We had a massive flood a year and a half ago, lost 26 people. Um, just, you know, it was just a one day kind of uh, horrible occurrence. Um, the, the flood insurance program is so under, underwater. It's so, un, I mean, it's so far down. What is it, 20, 24, 24 billion dollars. So we need to make it work. Uh, and, and I think you see us struggling trying to find a solution to that rather than just slapping dollars at it. Um, but I think correct data is interesting. And I'll, I know we're out of time, but I will say it's anecdotally in that flood that we had last year, there was an area of um, near Rupert, West Virginia. No, it was Raynell. At Raynell, West Virginia, where the, the property owners had fallen out of the floodplain, according to the, the, uh, the new mapping, they couldn't believe it because they'd known that they had flooded at least twice over the last 20 years, and they got wiped out, and they didn't have any flood insurance. So there are problems. That's just an anecdotal problem. But I know our state geological survey folks are trying to work, um, work a lot with that. And then some people fall into the flood program when they're, you know, 60 feet up on the mountain. So it, it, there are issues, but I think it's getting a lot better in terms of accuracy of data. I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Please thank the senator for joining us this morning.